last lecture series here at Tarleton State University. If you're wondering if I am Javier Garza, I will tell you I am not. Uh, he is uh, not feeling well, and so I am filling in as the MC. I feel like a paratrooper that was, that's in an aircraft with the green light on, and I thought somebody was going to go before me, and it looks like the sergeant said, it's my turn first. <laughs> So uh, we are going to do this as a, as a team this evening. I have the privilege to talk with you this evening about the history of the last lecture, where it began and what it means to Tarleton State University. In 1955, UCLA featured six lectures for distinguished uh, faculty figures, such as the philosopher professor Abraham Kaplan, chemistry professor Kenneth Trueblood, and legendary basketball coach, John Wooden. And each lecturer shared their own life philosophy through the lens of their discipline, interests, and personal life experiences. In the years since, the last lecture has become a tradition at many universities across the United States and in the world. And that tradition has made its way to Tarleton State University. The last lecture award uh, is only uh, uh, <coughs> delivered and chosen uh, by the student body. It is the only award that we have at Tarleton State University that is selected only by the student body. Students are invited to nominate an outstanding professor who has inspired and influenced them in their education and life and outlook in life. The student body will consider nominations and select a professor to give this a, an address based on this question. And the question is, if you had one final opportunity to address your students and colleagues, what would you share with your audience? The inaugural installment of the last lecture series at Tarleton State University was delivered on October the 21st, 2014. To begin the series, Dr. Chris Guthrie was asked by the faculty fellows to serve as our speaker. And after this initial lecture by Dr. Guthrie, student government developed the voting process for the fall 2015 speaker. And in April of 2015, Dr. Jim Kirby was selected by our students to be our second last lecture series speaker. I have the privilege to share with you a little bit about this outstanding educator, researcher, and a man of service to the community, Dr. Jim Kirby. Dr. James C. Kirby, Jim, joined the Tarleton faculty in 1983 as an assistant professor of mathematics. Since his arrival, he has taught undergraduate courses, including algebra, trigonometry, probability, statistics, calculus, and many, many other courses related to realm uh, mathematics, including research and other opportunities for students. He is directed. Dr. Kirby received tenure and was promoted to associate professor in 1989 and received a promotion to professor in 1995. During his more than three decades at Tarleton State University, Dr. Kirby has published nine times in the College of Mathematics Journal and has had continu has, uh, continued contributions in one book called Mathematics, Fallacies, Flaws, and Flim Flam. I need to read this book. He has presented 12 papers at professional meetings of the Mathematics Association of America. Dr. Kirby has been the recipient of many honors and awards and research grants during his work here at Tarleton State University, including the Phi Eta Sigma Distinguished Teaching Award, the OA Grant Excellence in Teaching Award, and the Jack and Louise Author Excellence in Teaching Award. Do you see a pattern? It's no wonder the students chose Dr. Jim Kirby. He's also a Regents Professor of the Texas A&M University System. 
He was a sponsor of Alpha Chi National Honor Society for 18 years. He served as an assistant and then an official sponsor for the local chapter, vice president and then president of Region 1, which consists of New Mexico, Oklahoma, and the western two-thirds of Texas. Texas is so big we can only do two-thirds, I guess. And finally, as a member of the National Council of Alpha Phi Chi, under his sponsorship, the local chapter was chosen um, as the outstanding chapter in the nation out of all the chapters in 1997. Administratively, he has served as interim department head of mathematics, physics, and engineering here at Tarleton State University. Dr. Kirby is a, na a native Texan, received a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics from Tarleton State University, and his Master of Science and Doctor of Philosophy from New Mexico State University. He has been married uh, to the former Anita Castleman for 30 years. They have three children, Josh, wife Katie, granddaughter Adeline, and she is precious and beautiful by the way. Chad, not that the others aren't, I didn't mean to, you know, I'm so sorry, went off script there. <laughs> Chad and Amanda and husband Justin. Dr. Kirby is truly an inspiration. Those of you that know him as I do, community, faculty, students, administration, when you walk out on, uh, anywhere at Tarleton, if you see Dr. Kirby, he runs over to you, he'll hug you maybe, he'll tell you some math problem that you may not understand, <laughs> but he'll laugh, tell you a joke, and you always feel better. That is Dr. Jim Kirby. And tonight, you'll get a taste of his life, his tenure, and his love for teaching here at Tarleton State University. And you'll see why the students chose him. Please direct your attention to our video.
Dominic Dottavio of the lead guitar. Wow, thank you so much for being here tonight. This is quite an honor. I want to tell you a story about an article that appeared in a newspaper column of a noted columnist, Robert Schuler, several, several years ago. It began, Dr. Schuler, said the man sitting next to me in the airplane. He said, are you an author? Noticing one of the books in my backpack that had a picture on it of me. He said, yes, I am. He said, so am I. What do you write about, he asked me. I said, possibility <coughs> thinking. And then being polite to this man, I said, what do you write about? He says, higher mathematics. <laughs> wow. <laughs> he said, Dr. Schumer, let me tell you a true story. Many, many years ago, when I was a senior at Stanford University, about 40 years ago, I had a very important test one day. Well, I showed up to class a little bit late. You ever done that? Grabbed the papers, went back to my desk, and began working feverishly through the problems. And I was really doing pretty well on the test. And then I got to the end of all of the written work, and I noticed a couple of problems on the blackboard. So I began working on those. They seemed a little tougher than the ones that I worked through the paper, but I just kept working through them and working through them and test ended and I wasn't done. I asked the professor, I said, could I have a little bit more time? And he said, sure, George. So I went home and continued to work on those problems. And I turned them into the professor one Saturday afternoon. Sunday morning, as I was asleep, there was a knocking on my door. George, George. You've made mathematical history. I was puzzled. What are you talking about? He said, George, you came to class late for the <laughs> test. And I told the class, eh, this is a tough, this is a tough quiz. This is tough material. And I said, there are some problems in this area, though, that have never been solved by anyone, including Einstein. And I put two of them on the board. George! You solved a problem that even Einstein couldn't solve. Now, Dr. Schuler, he said, I ask you, do you think I would have been able to solve that problem if I had thought it was unsolvable? Both the author and the mathematician agreed that the most dangerous person in the world is the <coughs> negative thinking person. Positivity thinking sets you free to do even greater things than you could ever imagine. George Donzig, a very important figure in the mathematical field of operations research, credits the launch of his career to this particular incident. It is so great to have each of you here today for my contribution in the last lecture series, The Power of of positive thinking in education, even, no, especially in mathematics. I would like to thank all of those who have contributed to my teaching career here at Tarleton, but if I named all of them specifically, we would be here all night. But I do want to thank several. First of all, I want to thank all of those at Tarleton that have worked so hard and so tirelessly for this evening, and I must recognize Doug Hanna, who headed up all of this group, and the faculty fellows. Unfortunately, Javier Garza, Garza was unable to be here this evening, but I want to thank Javier for all of his contributions. Javier and I have been friends for over 20 years, and this was kind of his brainchild, and I want to thank him for getting that going. I want to thank my stage partner, Jim Gentry, who is absolutely marvelous and wonderful in what he does. I want to thank all of the sponsors of this event, my friends, my church family, those who have traveled long distances, <coughs> former students, and I know there's a lot of you here, and I'm very grateful for that. I want to thank the student body for selecting me to give this lecture. Those who have traveled long distances, I want to thank all of my Tarleton colleagues and all of the Tarleton administrators. 
I want to thank Brewer Chevrolet for putting me in a Corvette. <laughs> My wife said, you better enjoy that because I don't want you going through midlife crisis. You may not get in another one of those. But I like that. That was a lot of fun. Uh, I want to uh, thank all of my family. I have a lot of family here. I have family from Florida and Colorado here tonight. Uh, I especially want to thank my children, Josh, and his wife, Katie, with our granddaughter, Adeline, my son, Chad, my daughter, Amanda, and her husband, Justin. And I want to acknowledge my wife of 30 years, Anita. And I would like to thank God without whom none of this would have been possible. In my 37 year career, 32 of it right here at Tarleton, I have tried to bring positive thinking into the classroom. And I modeled that story of George Dodson I told you at the beginning. In the very first class that I ever taught, I went to New Mexico State and as a graduate student, I worked in a tutor center for about a year where people just came for help. And then I was assigned to teach my first course in the summer of 1979. They assigned me to teach business calculus. What? Now that sounds like. But the name of the book was Modern Mathematics. So I had a great idea. I decided I was going to teach my students business calculus, but I was never going to use the dreaded C word. I must tell you, I have a very good friend that was concerned. Are you going to talk about a lot of math tonight? And I said, Rebecca, I guarantee you, I will not talk about anything beyond calculus three. And I'm not going to. So I taught this course in business mathematics under its title, Modern Mathematics. And in New Mexico State, we had an unusual semester arrangement. We finished our semester, gave final exams, and then met one more time to give the final exam back. So I had an opportunity to do that. And I asked the students, I said, so what have y'all been studying this semester? And they said, eh, business, math, whatever. I said, you've been studying calculus. They said, we've been studying what? I said, yes. I wonder, would the people that excelled at that had excelled if I had set a negative tone for them from the beginning. We're going to be talking about the positive thinker tonight. The positive thinker sees opportunity where others see impossibility. I want to illustrate this with a poem written by Edgar A. Guest. Somebody said that it couldn't be done, but with a chuckle replied that Maybe it couldn't, but he would be one who wouldn't say so till he tried. So he buckled right in with a trace of a grin on his face. If he worried, he hid it. He started to sing <coughs> as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done, and he did it. There are thousands to tell you it cannot be done. There are thousands to prophesy failure. There are thousands to point out to you one by one the dangers that wait to assail you. But just buckle in with a bit of a grin. Just take off your coat and go to it. Just start to sing as you tackle the thing that cannot be done and you'll do it. I would like to give you a very visual demonstration of this particular concept right here. I picked up a copy before I came of the Stephenville Empire Tribune today. Now those of you from out of town probably haven't read the Stephenville Empire Tribune, but it's only four pages. It doesn't take very long to read, but I'm going to thumb through this paper. I don't expect you to read it, but I want you to notice a headline or a picture or something that you would recognize if you were to ever see it again. Lots of bold color pictures, lots of things. Perhaps our Stephenville residents have already read this today. Well, I'm going to create an illusion. I'm going to create the illusion of tearing this newspaper. Now, you might think 
that in my creating this illusion, that you hear paper tearing. You might even think you see some torn edges. But I'm going to tell you, I'm just creating the illusion of tearing this newspaper. Somebody says, wow, it's a pretty good illusion. That thing looks like it is ripped, literally, to shreds. If I wanted to read that, it would be very difficult to piece this thing back together. But I want you to look very carefully. Part of my illusion just appeared to drop to the stage floor. I will pretend to pick part of my illusion up. <laughs> I did this on this very stage about 30 years ago when the Cross Timbers Fine Arts Council sponsored an event called the Fine Arts Follies. It was a local talent show. It was so much fun. But I'm going to take this and I'm going to squeeze it together. And I want you to remember that the, the uh, possibility thinker just isn't tripped up by things that seem impossible. Because I tell you that this paper is not torn up. It is all in one piece. Do you believe me? Do you believe me now? Impossibility thinking is negative. Possibility thinking sets you free. I would like to suggest to you that the positive thinker says not yet when others say never. The work which George Donzig did, you have all actually profited from many times. For example, when you have flown on an airline, you've experienced the proper construction of an airline schedule. This moves people to where they need to be in the most efficient manner. This subject is called operations research, or also known as optimization. It's all about getting the most out of the least based upon the resources available. A famous unsolved problem in this area called the traveling salesman problem actually now more politically correct, referred to as the traveling salesperson problem, <laughs> abbreviated as the TSP, so you don't have to commit, has to do with... <laughs> <laughs> the TSP has to do with what order you should travel to a group of cities in order to accomplish your sales for the least uh, amount of travel costs. Well, I call it an unsolved problem because nobody has ever been able to figure out a way to determine this on a state-of-art computer in a reasonable amount of time for a large number of cities. This is important in areas like manufacturing when you want to drill a bunch of holes in a piece of sheet metal and you need an order to move from hole to hole. You actually solve a version of the traveling salesman problem every time you go to do errands in town. Because you're going to go here, and you're going to go here, and you kind of do it where you're not traveling as much. Now you're going to laugh at me, but I solve a version of the traveling salesman problem every time I mow my yard. That's because I mow with my riding lawnmower, then what do you got to do? Get the push mower and mow around all the trees. So you need an order to move around the trees. Well, I just moved to the nearest tree. Now, that's actually one of the methods, methods for approximately solving the traveling salesman problem. It's, called, it's got a name. It's called the nearest neighbor algorithm. But I like to get the most out of the least. I think probably I got interested in operations research or optimization because I am an optimist. Give me lemons, I want to make lemonade. Some of my favorite sayings are, don't say the sky is the limit. There are footprints on the moon. And the problem is not that we aim too high and miss. The problem is we aim too low and hit. The man that believes that he can do something is probably right. And so is the person that believes he can't. Picture this. It's a great story. Man's running from a bull. He is running as fast as he can. And he notices a cliff in front of him. He is in big time trouble. 
But as he's running before the cliff, he looks up and he sees a tree with a branch that is probably 11 feet high, far out of his grasp. But running from the bull, he jumps for the limb, knowing that that is his only hope. Well, unfortunately, he missed it. But he got it on the way down. <laughs> the positive thinker tries another way rather than giving up. In talking about the way a number of things can be done, I feel compelled to relate to you a story that happened the first semester after Anita and I got married. I was preparing notes for a class, and there was a problem in the book. It said, a man has five shirts, four, four pair of pants, and six pairs of shoes. How many possible outfits does he have? My newlywed wife, upon hearing that, said, what colors are they? <laughs> very perceptive and she in fact raises a much more interesting problem but what colors are they but you see to try to count all of those would be a very difficult thing to do so we need some processes in able to find another way rather than giving up you know I like to also think about the fact that there really aren't new problems they're just old problems that look different they're in disguise let me give you an illustration. Suppose you want a pan of boiling water. Maybe you want to cook a hard-boiled egg. By the way, if you're a new cook, you should know you put the whole egg in the water. You don't crack the egg into the water. I've actually seen that done. But let's suppose that all you knew how to do in cooking was if there was a pan of water on the stove, you could turn the stove on. Eventually, you would have a pan of boiling water. Okay? Now suppose you walk in a room and you see a pan of water in the sink and you want a pan of boiling water. This is not a new problem. It's an old problem disguised. Simply take the pan of water and put it on the stove. You already know how to do that problem. Further, suppose that you walk into that room and there's an empty pan in the sink and it's under the faucet. This is not a new problem. It is an old problem disguised. Simply fill the pan with water. You have seen that problem before. This idea can obviously be continued indefinitely. There are not new problems. There are just simply old problems that are disguised. Uh, I'm often called by someone from the community asking me how to do a problem. It's a kind of a neat deal. You know, we're a university. Somebody calls the university, hey, I need to know how to do something. And they are transferred to the appropriate department. And I've answered many of these calls. Well, I enjoy that. The first thing I do is get a sheet of paper and work the problem with them on the phone. And when I'm done with it, I, I like to write the name down, date it, and then go take that problem and file it in the appropriate course where the material was used to solve the problem. Then guess what? When I'm in the classroom teaching that class and some student says, what am I ever going to use this for? Well, it turns out that on January 13th, 1988, I got this call. <laughs> it was about 88, I got a call from a gentleman in a neighboring town. He was framing a roof. This roof was to have three and a half pitch, which meant it was to rise three and a half inches for every foot that you moved over. That was unusual. Roofs of that slope are typically three pitch or four pitch. And this gentleman said, I've taken the numbers on how to frame the rafters for three and four and I've averaged them, but it doesn't really seem to be working. Well, I explained to him why that didn't work, and then I gave him what he needed 
in order to find the numbers that he did. Oh, he was so happy. He said, thank you so much. You have saved me from climbing about 20 roofs over here. I said, I'm really glad that's helped you. I haven't given you my consulting fee yet. <laughs> After a few moments of nervous silence, I, I did tell him that my advice was free. Another really interesting thing to me about mathematics is that there are different ways of doing the problem that gives the same result. So we can see an easier way to do it. I was stumbling through the stations one night channel surfing and I saw this old episode of a, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? I thought, boy, I hope I am. So the question comes up, the geography question. It says, how many states border another state? So I thought, well, Texas borders Oklahoma and Louisiana. And I thought, wait a minute. Let's change the problem. Let's not find how many do border another state. Let's find out how many don't. Alaska and Hawaii don't, so 48 do. I think that's a little easier way to come up with the solution to that particular problem. Perhaps you're interested in the March Madness stuff, the NCAA basketball tournament. They used to be purists. They started with 64 teams and they played. Now they've got all these little play-in games and all this stuff. But let's just suppose once they're down to 64 games, somebody says, 64 teams, somebody says, how many games does it take to crown a champion? Well, you can draw that bracket. You can start counting all the little games and it'll take you a while to do that. Or you can be a little more clever than that and think, you know, there's... 32 games in the first round, and so there's 16 in the second, and you can observe that pattern, and you can count that up. Or, you can approach it like this. Look, there's 64 teams. It's a single elimination tournament. Everybody loses a game except the winner. So there are 63 losers and one winner. To get a loser takes a game. So there's 63 games. Two ways to solve the same problem. Another way, rather than giving up. One of my favorite examples of this was a very, very young German mathematician. His name was Carl Friedrich Gauss. Gauss went in the first grade. His teacher wanted some time to do some work and assigned the kids the task of finding what the numbers 1 to 100 add up to. Surely that will take them a while and I can get the grades average and everything. But little gal said, wait a minute, I don't want to add all that up. One and two is three, three and three is six. That's going to take a long time. But he said, wait a minute, the first number is one, and the last number is a hundred. If I was to add those, I'd get 101. The second number is two, and the next to the last number is 99. If I add those, I'd also get 101. Wait a minute, every time I add them, I'm going to get 101. There's a hundred numbers, so there's 50 pairs, so there's 50 hundreds and 50 ones. 50 50. Teacher wasn't real happy with him. But he was very clever in finding a simpler way in order to do that particular problem. The positive thinker optimizes every opportunity. In 2002, I was listening to radio station KVIL in my office, and they announced they were going to have a contest. It was a nationwide contest. There were something like 300 stations that were going to simultaneously play a little tone. And when the tone was played, the 110th nationwide caller would win $1,000. What in the world are the chances of that? Well, they played the tone, I called, busy signal. Later, they played the tone, I called, busy signal. This went on for several weeks. And then I got to thinking, as a former DJ, wait a minute, their phone does not have 110 lines. They're having to answer every call. You're caller number one, sorry. You're caller number two, sorry. You're caller number three, sorry. I thought, okay, I'll figure out how long it takes to answer each one of those calls. See the number of seconds. That's the way mathematicians think. Divide it into 110. And I've got about three minutes. 
And then it dawned on me, you know what? I gave up too soon all those times, calling and getting those busy signals and bailed out. So I decided that the next time I heard the tone, I was going to wait three minutes. Rebecca, I was grading a calculus three test that day. <laughs> I decided I would grade for three more minutes and then call. So I'm rocking along and I hear the tone. So I looked at the clock and I waited three minutes. And I called the number. But this time, instead of hearing the busy signal, I heard. You are now being connected to the studio. The next voice said, Congratulations! You just won a thousand dollars! mathematics class, I had just taught the class how to calculate a loan payment. Calculate the payment on the house, on the car. <coughs> and so this one young lady after learning that formula said, Dr. Kirby, the formula that you gave us said that my trailer payment should be more than it we're actually paying. Boy, she started getting advice from the class. Well, don't say anything about it. Well, desiring to teach a lesson a little more important than mathematics, I said, you know what? You should contact that loan company as soon as you can. Monday afternoon, she comes in somewhat red-faced. She said, I got a letter from my loan company this weekend. We're $800 behind in our payments. Come to contact, catch things like that early. Make sure you're paying the right amount of money. The positive thinker optimizes every opportunity. A blonde <coughs> walks into a bank. <laughs> My wife's a blonde. <laughs> says, I want to borrow $5,000. Loan officer says, okay, we're going to need some security. She said, okay. She hands him the keys to her brand new Rolls Royce. I hadn't ridden in one of those either. So it's parked out on the street, so everything checks out, and they drive the Rolls into the underground parking lot. She gets her $5,000 and off she goes, and all is great. So she comes back in two weeks, pays the $5,000 and her interest, which came to $15.17. And the loan officer says, I'm a little confused. While you were gone, we checked you out and found out that you are a multi-millionaire. Why in the world would you bother to borrow $5,000? She said, well, where else in New York City can I park my car for two weeks for 15 bucks? <laughs> A blind joke with a mathematical twist at the end. <laughs> a young mother brings her baby to the doctor. She's frantic. She says, Doctor, my baby is very, very sick. His temperature is 200 degrees. <laughs> Dr. Schaefer said, ma'am, how did you figure that? If your baby's temperature was 200 degrees, he would be, she would be very sick. She said, I know, he is. She said, I did what the instruction said. I took the temperature under his arm, it was 100, and I added one and got 200. <laughs> yes, a blonde joke with a mathematical twist at the end. Mathematics is, in fact, everywhere. Well, I want to suggest to you that the positive thinker finds an easier way to do things. I was assigned many, many years ago to teach a quadriplegic in mathematics, a very fine young man who's actually here tonight. 
And I decided that I needed to find some things that he could do totally mentally apart from a helper that was assigned to him to be able to write for him. And so there's a lot of rules of thumbs in mathematics, so I thought I'm going to skill him in many of these. I'll share a few of you with them. And what I did is I took those and put them on a test and let the other members of the class do it as well. And he did better than they did in mastering those rules of thumb. One of them is converting temperatures from centigrade to Fahrenheit. The rule to do that says multiply the centigrade temperature by nine-fifths and add 32. Try doing that mentally. Now, it's not very easy to do mentally. Well, the rule of thumb says, hey, don't, don't multiply by nine-fifths. Multiply by two. That's a little too much. And don't add 32. Add 30 to compensate for it. So you double it and add 30. So the next time you're driving by, say, Gilbert Intermediate, and it says it's 20 degrees centigrade outside, think to yourself, 20 times 2 is 40, plus 30 is 70. It's about 70 degrees outside. A very powerful rule of thumb. Another rule of thumb has to do with how long money takes to double. There's a rule called the rule of 72 that gives an approximation of how long it takes money to double. Divide the interest rate into 72 and get the number of years. For example, at 9%, it takes money about eight years to double. You can use the formulas and calculate it exactly, but you can get an estimation of it. And how many of you looked at your amortization table on your house loan and noticed that almost all of your first payment is interest? Well, that's a little depressing. It's going to take you forever to pay the house off. But it's really encouraging when you look at the last line and it's almost all the principal. So if you want to approximate the house payment, calculate the interest, and just add a little bit more. That's a rule of thumb that allows you to do that. The positive thinker finds an easier way to do things. And I want you to notice that in telling those rule of thumb, I didn't use the word simply. I didn't say simply double it and add 30. I didn't say simply divide it into 72. And I didn't say simply add a little bit of interest because you know what I believe? I believe that in addition to not saying something is hard, as I talked about at the beginning, it's also very important not to say something is easy. Because what if you can't do it and it's easy? That's pretty depressing. And what if you can do it? What have you accomplished? It was an easy thing to do. So I think those are very important concepts in that area. Mathematics is really... It's just all about patterns. One of my favorite, earliest memories of observing a pattern was in Miss Bradley's fifth grade music class. You know what? I've got three of my high school classmates here tonight. Miss Bradley was at South Elementary in Brownwood, Texas. And Miss Bradley taught us what was called the circle of fifths. The circle of fifths said, you could locate how many sharps and flats there are, but tell you what the key was. But I noticed, stay with me here a moment, I noticed that if you took the number of sharps and multiplied by four, and then subtracted seven as many times as you can, it would tell you how far to count from C to get the key. For example, two sharps, multiply two by four, and you get eight. Subtract 7 and you get 1. Counting 1 from C gives you the key of D. D is the key with two sharps. You know what I remember? I remember Miss Bradley looking at me the way that many of you were looking at me right now. <laughs> I, did, I did go on to tell her that for flat you multiply by 3. Still works. The positive thinker finds an easier way to do things. Patterns are also good for memory aids. For example, how many of you can name the Great Lakes? Well, if I tell you the little keyword, Holmes, Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Erie, Superior, that's the Great Lakes. 
That's the acronym. I learned at a very early age to associate things, to remember things, and the acronym is such a great way to do that. Recruitment is so important at Tarleton State University. And you know, it's pretty important to know where everybody comes from here. And you know, you're not going to learn where everybody comes from here without some sort of a memory aid, some sort of a trick. I went over to the registrar's office the other day and I, I said, can I see the database where everybody is from? It looked at me kind of funny. Dr. Uh, Kirby, what do you want that for? Well, I need to learn where everybody's from here. Really? So I went to that along. I found out, you know what? We have students here at, at Tarleton on, on this campus. We have students here from Waco, Hyco, Hondo, Navasota, Winsboro, Jacksboro, Hillsboro, Santa Rosa, Austin, Houston, Galveston, Texas, Santa Frisco, Buffalo, Conroe, Corsicana, Goliath, Grosbeck, Red Rose, Red Oak, Posto, Lago, Pruderville, Pruderville, Van Horn, Van Horn, I guess I could keep walking or <laughs> We have our students here. We've got far reaching coverage with all of this. You know what I've also found is that people are amazed with date patterns. Have you noticed that? There'll be something come up, oh, this is, this is so, this will never happen again. Of course, I guess if you've been waiting for it for 40 years to happen, that's pretty cool. It'll never happen again. For example, uh, December 12th of 12 is 12, 12, 12. Hey, that's pretty cool. My favorite date pattern occurred July the 8th of 1990. July the 8th of 1990. ABC News reported a week in advance that at 12.34 and 56 seconds, 7, 8, 90, the digits would read on a digital watch, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7-8-9-0. Oh, there they all are. <laughs> that particular day was a Sunday. My family and I, Anita, Josh, and Chad, Amanda wasn't born yet, so she didn't get to enjoy this, along with my sister Robin, who was a college student here at Tarleton at the time, were eating lunch at Mazio's Pizza. <laughs> I set an alarm on my watch. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. Oh, it's time. We gathered on the watch. <laughs> 12, 34, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, there it is! Robin and I were marveling at the mathematical beauty of that watch. <laughs> when my lovely wife Anita says, you know, if I were not married to a mathematician, I would just be sitting here eating my pizza. <laughs> <laughs> the positive thinker realizes that there is a big picture. It has been my goal over the years to find any way that I can to motivate a student. Of course, the best way is to find something in their field to which the, student, the topic relates. That goes back to the files that I create based upon phone calls. But sometimes a student just needs a little encouragement. I once had a Stephenville High School football player in class that was struggling to pass my course. As we were going into the final exam, I thought of a way to motivate him because I remembered a game in which the team was playing that found us badly down at halftime, playing a much inferior team. I think it was Weatherford. <laughs> it was the result of winning a really big game the week before over Brownwood. And uh, I asked him, I said, well, y'all came back and won that game. What happened at halftime? He said, oh, the locker room was pretty intense. He said, people were yelling and screaming. and said, in fact, I beat up a guy that wasn't as serious as he ought to be. <laughs> well, that team went out and won that ball game. 
based upon that intensity. And I told this fine young man, I said, I want you to remember the drive it took to win that ball game. And he looked at me, and he got that game face on, and he gritted his teeth, and he said, I can do this. You know what the best part of that story is? He did it. He was motivated by that, and he did it. It reminded me a lot of the movie Stand and Deliver, which if you've not seen that movie, I highly recommend it. It's a story about a teacher named Jaime Escalante that was able to teach calculus, yes, calculus, to some minority students that had never been successful. In that movie, he says many times, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. And the moral of that story is they did do it. They were able to do that. A good moral of that summer story is summarized by the saying, if you think that you have been asked to do the impossible, please don't disturb the person next to you that is doing it. Perhaps that's the best thing for us to remember about any difficult situation in life is that we can do it. Mathematics is certainly an area in which this can be applied. Mathematics has been a big part of my life. I have taught college mathematics for 37 years. It has paid my bills. I have been interested in mathematics since grade school. I know I'm in the minority in the room, but I genuinely love doing mathematics. It is a great discipline, and it has changed the world. This room wouldn't stand, your cars wouldn't run, and your phones would not text without mathematics. <laughs> And though mathematics has been a big part of my life, mathematics has never been my life. I have chosen to focus on faith, family, and friends. When my children were younger, I chose to rarely bring home work so I could spend my evenings with my family. I have chosen to teach only one summer session for many years so I can take vacations with my family and volunteer at summer youth camps. An extremely rewarding experience. Even as I have taught mathematics, I've tried to forge relationships with students and many of these relationships have continued for many years. These opportunities have enriched my life in ways that mathematics alone never could. Whatever your discipline in academics, whatever your work, there is always a bigger picture. Remember the power of positive thinking. Even, no, especially in mathematics, and in fact, in all that we do, yes, you can do it. Thank you very much. for questions and we have a microphone right there in the middle of the uh, auditorium and we would like you to come forward and ask Dr. Kirby any questions you may have. Please come forward. (coughs) 
I'll have to start making up questions. Surely someone has a question for Dr. Kirby. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Yes, when sir. did you first uh, get interested in doing magic tricks? I was about four or five years old. Got one of those little magic sets from uh, for Christmas and one of the tricks and kind of did that all my life. My sister is present tonight, Robin, and when, uh, she's, she's 10 years younger than I am. And then when she began having birthday parties, I performed magic at her birthday. And then... Uh, uh, when, I, when I moved to Stephenville, a, a, a lady from a church, Karen Bells, who works over here at Tarleton, uh, her, her daughter was having a birthday and asked if I would do a party, and I, I did, and then it started kind of getting around with word of mouth, and I did a lot of magic in Stephenville for a long time. But I use it in the classroom, and you know, you see these things on TV all of the time, these magicians read your mind, and it's all mathematics. I tell my classes, a lot of times they say, what can you use mathematics for? I say, you know what? David Copperfield uses mathematics, and last I checked, he was making about $50 million a year. I think I could live on a million a week, Jim. What do you think? I'd like to try anyway. But I use a lot of the, uh, the techniques that those tricks can be done. I will use in a, in a, in a course to create a focus on what's, uh, what the topic is going to be used for, and the kids find that to be really interesting. I knew mathematics was magic. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have uh, another question. Dr. Fane. <laughs> Hi, Jimmy. <laughs> Could you tell this audience about the paper you gave at an Alpha Chi convention and why you gave it? Say that again now. I'm sorry. You gave a mathematical. Oh, okay. I got you. At I got Alpha you. Alpha convention. I was a student at Tarleton from 1975 to 78, and in 1977 I was inducted into Alpha Chi, and Alpha Chi does conventions, which uh, Jim mentioned, a lot of conventions I've been sponsored. And uh, so anyway, as a student, uh, I, I wanted to take an overload in a class. I needed to take 19 hours, and Dr. Fain was the dean of arts and sciences at the time. <laughs> He'd been trying to get me to get a paper to go to an Alpha Chi convention and, and give a paper. And so this one particular day, I said, Dr. Fain, I need your signature on this override card. And he said, hmm, I'll sign that if you'll commit to present a paper at the Alpha Chi convention. <laughs> so I did, and he did, and I presented, and I won $500 for presenting that. <laughs> I'm beginning to think I should have chosen math. Do I know? There's a lot of money it seems like. <laughs> yeah. Well, i got to run that forward. i got to run Dr. Fain's four-story forward five years now. So I've, I've finished graduate school. I'm coming back and I'm teaching at Tarleton. It's 1983. And I go over there to visit with Dr. Fain. And he says, uh, he says, how's everything going? I said, fine. I said, how's everything here? He said, fine. I said, Dr. Fain, how's Alpha Chi doing? And Dr. Fain said, oh, Jim, it's great. I went from Jimmy to Jim by then. He said, it's great. He said, you know what? We've actually got a new sponsor. It's a young fella. He just finished his PhD. In fact, today's his first day on campus. <laughs> well, that was the beginning of a 20-year run. It was pretty great. <laughs> Dr. Fain's a motivator, isn't he? <laughs> Yes, please. All right. So I don't believe is Hotel California your favorite Eagles tune. If not, what is? And then share uh, at least one great experience at going to an Eagles concert. Oh, how great is this question? <laughs> well, first of all, I mentioned Doug Hanna and the incredible work Doug has done with this. And so Doug and I sat down to brainstorm how we wanted to uh, intro the show tonight. And. Uh, Wind blowing through your hair. Of course, really, for me, that's kind of hard. But that's <laughs> I said, I, I like Hotel California. Uh, Chris used a lot of Metallica in his last lecture speech uh, last year. Uh, but I said, I, I think I'd like to do Hotel California. I said, I'll tell you why. In November of 1976, I went to see an Eagles concert. And I'd never seen one before. I've seen them four times now. 
But they, they, they were playing for a while. And they said, you know what? We're going we're gonna to play something for you new. We've, we've, we will play something for you new. It's a little song called Hotel California. So the first time I heard that song was live. Now, doing a little research years later, I found that that's actually the first time they'd ever played that song. So we just thought that was somewhat fitting. Now, I have another favorite, favorite, favorite Eagle song is Take It Easy. And one of the reasons Take It Easy is one of my favorite songs is the line early on in that song, standing on a corner in Winslow, Arizona. Well, my wife and I last year took a trip to Arizona, and I thought, Arizona, what a ugly state. Oh, no. Get to the western part of Arizona, it's gorgeous. But on the way, we stopped in Winslow, Arizona. I said, let's go stand in a corner on Winslow, Arizona. <laughs> well, lo and behold, you get into Winslow and there's signs. Standing on a corner, four miles. So they got this one place that's dedicated to stand on the corner. There's a statue of Jackson Brown who wrote the song. And you can pose with the statue. Standing on a corner in Winslow, Arizona. Love it. Great song. Yes, sir. Dr. Kirby, how are you? Is that a Mari Martinez? <laughs> wow, another great former student. So, a question for you. Uh, what are some of the things that some of your students have done that have drove you nuts? <laughs> That's a loaded question, sir. <laughs> That's a great question coming from a great source. <laughs> Amari, Amari, when were you in my class first? 20 plus years ago, probably? Uh, 10. 10, oh well, okay. <laughs> Mari, Mari didn't go to class. <laughs> so he goes off and he does his things and he starts working at Chamberlain Elementary where my, my wife is the registrar. And this one particular day, Amari comes up to Anita and he says, Mrs. Kirby, how are you doing today? Can I do anything for you? She's really nice to her. She says, what is going on? He said, I've got to go back up there and take your husband. <laughs> so I said, she said, go to class. But one day, Mari wasn't in class, and I found out why. It was the old, I set my alarm for p.m. instead of a.m. <laughs> <laughs> you ever heard that, colleagues? I'm gonna use That's it. a pretty good one. <laughs> Amari, if you don't know Amari, he, boy, he's a great computer guy. My house wouldn't work without him working on my computers. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, Dr. Kirby, uh, I've got a question for you. So, uh, you know, with school starting back, everything's been busy. And Is that Cody Gill? It might be. And so <laughs> you, have, you have no time, you know, you, you, you're dedicated to students, you're dedicated to family. But I have to know, when did you and Dr. Ottavio have time to play guitar like Joe Gales? <laughs> I have to know that. So. Okay. But I really do, real quick, want to thank you so much. You took, uh, I was a traditional student, then a non-traditional student, and uh, in every sense of the word, uh, and uh, came back. In the first class I came back, I had Dr. Kirby uh, when I uh, graduated high school for algebra, and then I left college went and played music for 10 years and came back and the first class I had was Dr. Kirby's trigonometry class and I he probably talks about how terrified I look because I was scared to death and he walked in and everything seemed to be all right so I do appreciate everything you gave me a chance Cody. to go back so thank Cody, you. If you're not familiar with Cody's work, Cody, Cody's traveled all over the world playing music, he's got lots of CDs, he's a great musician. So, Dr. Tavio, we, we bow to him, he's a real musician, but, you know, I, I guess one thing about, Dr. Fain mentioned Alpha Chi, one of the things I loved about Alpha Chi, I looked at a lot of transcripts with Alpha Chi. If you're not familiar with Alpha Chi, it's top 10% of the junior and senior class, and then the bylaws allow you to actually cut that off a little higher, and at Tarleton, we actually did cut that off a little higher a lot of the times, but you look at these transcripts. And this was my favorite transcript to look at. F, 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 D, W, F, 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 C, W, tenure gap. A, 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 A. -A. The non-traditional student, and I ask this trivia question, and I love it, I ask a lot of class, what's the average age of the Tarleton student? And I haven't looked lately, 
But for a while it was 26. You know, think, okay, 18, 19, 20, 21, about 21. No, it's the non-traditional students, the people that, you know, they get out and they see what it is they want to do. And that young man is such a classic example of that. And, uh, he, and he came back. And, and we have, I've talked about forging relationships with students. Uh, students, Cody and others like that, that's what's so much fun to see uh, that development. I got through Cody and concert at the park the other day and, and uh, that concert wasn't really well advertised. I, we almost got a private show. It was great because we could, we could converse about stuff like this. But uh, go and hear that young man if you can. But uh, non-traditional students, wow. It's an amazing, amazing thing. Um, I was wanting to know, every time I see you, you're always smiling, and so I will miss seeing that every day. Um, but my question for you is, what is your most memorable moment here at Charlton? Wow. <laughs> my most memorable moment at Charlton. You know what? It's happening right now. <laughs> I probably wasn't going to sleep tonight, and I'm probably not going to sleep tonight. I'm going to relive this, but no, this is this is amazing. This is the culmination of it. Jamie, Jamie and I have a lot of uh, Dr. Marshall teaches in the psychology department. I love being in another department. I've got a lot of friends in psychology, and it's fun to, to, to visit with her. But uh, that's that's the secret. Yes, sir. You have uh, something that you do Sunday evenings, four <laughs> till six. <laughs> And can you recite some of those? One is stating the books of the New Testament backwards. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is Alan Yeager who, who visits over with us. But okay. Uh, and I, I guess I better preface this a little bit. This, this was a little routine I did at camp many years. And, uh, and when you see this, you'll say, mm, he has too much time on his hands. <laughs> <laughs> it's tricks. Watch this. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z, Y, X, W, V, U, T, S, R, Q, P, O, N, M, L, K, J, I, H, G, F, E, D, C, B, A, Z, B, Y, C, X, D, W, E, P, F, U, G, T, H, S, I, R, J, Q, K, D, M, O, K, N, and so forth. One more question. So uh, let me finish his question. So I, I teach a little Bible drill at church on Sunday evenings for kids, and I have them saying amazing things, and, and, and this is one of my favorite stories in that regard. My oldest son was three years old, and he was doing some of this, and the kid sitting next to me, he's got a little book I made, said, he's just reading. I said, well, I'm not sure what I'm more happy about, his recitation of that or reading at three. <laughs> But Alan has asked for the New Testament backwards, Revelation, Jude, 3rd, 2nd, and 1st John, 2nd and 1st Peter, James, Hebrews, James, Philemon, Titus, 2nd and 1st Thessalonians, 2nd and 1st Timothy, Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, Galatians, 2nd and 1st Corinthians, Romans, Acts, John, Luke, Mark, Matthew. Thomas Holder. Well, what's funny was I was going to ask you to recite the alphabet. <laughs> But I guess I have a second one then. Uh, and you don't have to recite it, but how many digits can you uh, go with the uh, pi 3.14? How far can you go? I can do about 30. 30 digits. And of course, the one thing about it, people that can't, as you know, I said, you know, he said the alphabet all those way. I'm not even really sure if that's right. I can scout a bunch of numbers you wouldn't have. But I can do about 30. <laughs> There's somebody Googling it, I'm sure, you know. Like that. You know, there's an interesting thing about that. You'll read it in the paper sometimes. They'll, they'll say some supercomputer has calculated pi to some you know, three, four billion places. And I, I love to ask students, well, what good is that? And they say, well, it makes your calculations more accurate. I'm thinking, you really probably don't need quite that many to be accurate. But I'll tell you why they do that. So they come out with a new computer, and you want to get it some really tough problem to do to see if it's working right. So you get it to do that. And you compare it with the accepted value. And if they agree, you've got feeling pretty good about it. If they don't disagree, either the new one's bad or the old one's bad. Remember what happened with the penny and the chip about 15 years ago? That's how they found the problem and fixed it. 
So, here you go. Well, uh, Dr. Kirby, thank you for being one of our speakers for the last lecture series. We are so thankful that you did this, and on behalf of the students and Tarleton faculty, uh, we have a presentation for you, so I want to give that to you. And we have a case for it, of course, here. And I want to show the audience this. And this is heavy, people. I want you to know. It's the last lecture series, Dr. Jim Kirby, September 15, 2015, Carleton State University. On behalf of faculty fellows, we're so thankful. Thank you. Many family and friends here, and uh, I'm Dr. Kirby's oldest son, and this is his granddaughter, Adam. And so, you're um, giving me, you're giving her to me. <laughs> From 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. every day. <laughs> so all of your friends and family here have pooled money together, and we called the Greg Bruner, and uh, we got a really amazing deal on a red Corvette. And we'd like to present that to you. Now, if you'll hold your granddaughter a moment, I'd like to grab the keys to this amazing machine. <laughs> Thank you, Greg, for that deal. Amazing. Thank you all for your contributions. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. <laughs> I just noticed that. Uh, <laughs> I think the funniest thing for me was when you were in the car. The uh, I only saw that you went like maybe five miles per hour. <laughs> I was noticing numbers. I want you to know that. I was noticing numbers. Can I tell a quick story on Greg Bruner? Uh, Greg Bruner told me a long time ago, he said, Jim, 
If you can take a car on a test drive and make it disappear, I'll give it to you. So we were in a restaurant with his kids. His, his son and daughter graduated with our son Chad and daughter Amanda. And I said, well, Brad, could I put a sheet around it? He said, yeah. I said, could I raise the sheet 12 inches off the ground? He said, yeah. He's thinking, wait a minute. Is he taking me seriously here? His son, Kyle, is just rolling in the floor. So are we going off in this? So I was getting ready to buy a car from Brenner's, and I took it on a test drive. I drove it around a little bit. Park, one park in the ten bucks. Greg, I don't know what happened to the car. It's gone, so I guess it's mine. If I can find it. He backtracked on that a little bit. <laughs> Um, we have a reception outside in the lobby, uh, and uh, the Kirby family will be joining you shortly. We do ask that the Kirby family will come up on the stage right as we dismiss, uh, so that we can have photographs uh, with, uh, with your whole family to remember this event. Thank you, Dr. Kirby. Let's give him another hand. Please.